Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Winchell. Um, if you know me at all, you know me from my YouTube channel called Tank Tested, um, where I film aquascapes uh, by really, really talented people, as well as hopefully myself. So this is an aquarium that I created. I've been keeping aquariums for around 25 years, and I've been a filmmaker for around 15. Uh, professionally, I make documentaries for a living. So while I'm making YouTube videos on the side as a hobby, I make documentaries for National Geographic, both feature films, uh, television shows, and digital series for them. Today, I want to explore the power of photography when we talk about our home aquariums. Um, and in doing so, I want to take you on a journey. This is not a talk about ISO settings or camera settings or what lens to use. This is more an exploration of how to tell a story using a photograph and how to make the image that you want um, actually appear in your viewfinder. I'm gonna go through this story telling you information that I've learned from working with National Geographic photographers for more than a decade. Um, I am not a Nat Geo photographer and I don't represent Nat Geo here today, but I have had the opportunity to work with dozens of incredibly talented filmmakers over the years. So hopefully this is insightful for all of you. Now, the goal that I wanna take you on here is I want at the end of this for you all to see with new eyes. And by that, I don't mean literally new eyeballs. What I mean is that you see the process of photography differently, not just for your home aquarium, but for photography in general. Now, the reason why I want us all to document our aquariums better is because they are temporary. So this is an aquarium that I created about five years ago. This is one that I created about three years ago. And this is one I created last year. But none of these aquariums still exist because fundamentally, aquariums are temporary. They exist in a moment in time. And we can remember them or we can photograph them and have them be crisp and clear forever. Part of my ethos when I think about aquariums is that aquariums are art. They're not just a tank that keeps fish alive. So I visited my friend, uh, Justin, who has an Instagram uh, account called AquaWorks down in Richmond, Virginia. And I went into the corner of his house and I saw these two tanks. Now, these two tanks are both using the same basic types of plants, but they're very different. And I wanted to photograph each one of them the same way that you would a piece of art, because I think they are art. So, I photographed wide shots of the aquarium, something that showed the entire uh, palette or the entire canvas. But then I also photographed insert shots, close-ups, so that you can see the beauty of the aquarium. And I think that an image like this is beautiful in its own right, and it's made all the more special by the fact that it captures a moment in time. But the smaller tank is the one that I found more fascinating because it really highlights my belief that aquariums are art. See, as I was looking at the aquarium, something resonated with me, something about this tank connected with me. When I looked close up, you see the beautiful uh, collaging of colors of the reds and the greens and how there are dark and bright spots. And as I was looking at the aquarium, I looked out the window and the light started to stream across the back wall outside his window. And they look, to my eye, very similar. And as he set up this tank right in front of this window, I generally believe that it influenced his decision making on how he lit and how he grew the aquarium. And that's one of the powers that we have when we take pictures, is we can connect things together. So I always try to capture spaces, not just the aquarium. Where is the aquarium situated in the home? Because that is part of the story. Now, in addition, I also shoot video. And the reason why I shoot video of aquariums is because they are alive, they move. Even if you don't have fish in the aquarium, as these aquariums don't really have a lot of fish, they have movement. The plants undulate in the water current the water ripples and the colors bounce around the aquarium. And that's something you can't capture in, 
photography. That's something you only can do in video. So when I think about capturing an image of an aquarium, I think about it from the perspective of how do I tell a story that I can remember forever? And this aquarium in particular is really important to me because this is my favorite aquarium that I've ever seen in person. This was a tank set up by my friend Gazenfar. Now, he set this tank up about five years ago. He broke the tank down about six months after I filmed it. But I get to look at this tank pretty regularly because I made a video about it. It's a tank that inspires me. And I, in my mind, it looks one way. And then when I look at it on video, I see it looking quite different. But the important thing to me is the movement of the hair grass, that beautiful grass that captures the beauty and calmness that an aquarium can create. But documenting your home aquarium doesn't have to be about photographing a masterpiece. It can also be about documenting your own personal growth. This is the first aquar planted aquarium that I set up. I set up this tank about 11 years ago. This is the only photo I have of this tank. I wish I had taken more. There's, you know, spots on the glass. It was taken with a camera phone from 11 years ago, so it's not great. But you can see the growth that I had. So this is one of the next aquariums that I set up. I actually set this up at my desk. And you can see my striped shirt reflected in the dark areas on the crip, which is an ideal photography, but at least I have a documented instance of this tank. This is a tank that I set up on my home desk or my desk at the office. I didn't ask for permission beforehand, but I thought, well, if I put in like 50 shrimp and then I ask everyone in the office to name a shrimp, everyone will have an emotional buy-in and then the boss can't get rid of it. And that happened. The boss stopped by and she was like, what's going on here? And there was a little name checklist of every single person. So, you know, if you want to have a home aquarium at your desk, at your office, good way to do it. Um, and then I started taking photographs for competition. So this is another tank that I created. And then this is probably the tank that I'm proudest of, a 150-gallon aquarium. Uh, this was set up in a custom aquarium um, tank uh, that they gave me, and then I had the opportunity to escape something really beautiful. And as Dustin mentioned earlier, of having a big school of fish, of one species of fish, this is kind of what that looks like. There's about 70 rummy nose tetras swimming through this aquarium. And uh, rummy nose tetras are my absolute favorite aquarium fish because they school so tightly. They're just, and, and they're small. They're just beautiful little fish. Uh, and they're also really easy to keep. And then um, this tank. So this is a tank that I uh, created that was a biotope tank recreating the Rio Negro. And I created this a year and a half ago. It won first place in the Aquatic Gardeners Association biotope competition. But about a month ago, I thought, I want to do this again, and I want to iterate. And the power of video is that I could, re I could consult what I had previously and think about what I wanted to do differently. And what I really wanted to do here was create a flooded forest, so I actually created the trees. Uh, aquarium photography can also document change. So you see this tank, we saw it earlier, this is when it was first planted, grew in a little bit, and this is it when I photographed it for competition. Um, the same thing for my 150. This was when it was first planted. It felt like it had a lot of plants in it. Um, then about two months later, it felt like it had a lot of plants in it. And then by competition day, it had a huge number of plants in it. And then I kind of let it go a little bit, and it had too many plants in it. But if I didn't document the aquarium along the way, I wouldn't have gotten that moment where it looked its best. In addition, aquariums evolve over time. So this was created by my friend Nick. Um, this was a biotopes tank designed to mimic a stream. So here we captured the tank as it would look in spring. And then here's that same tank captured in fall. And we actually did this in real time. So these photos were taken six months apart, which is why the fish look so much bigger. Now, I want to actually talk to you about the process. We've talked about why I photograph aquariums. Now I want to talk about how to photograph aquariums. So, we're going to start with this aquarium. This is another tank by my friend Gazenfar. We wanted to enter this into the, uh, oh gosh, one of the aquarium contests. I forget which aquarium contest we actually entered this into. But we wanted to capture a beautiful photo of this tank. 
So this was our basic setup. Now, there's some bright lights, so you can't quite see what's going on here. But you'll see that the aquarium is framed in black. Now, that's not how the aquarium normally sits. If you're thinking about photographing an aquarium and you want something to look really beautiful, I really strongly recommend photographing at night and then framing the tank with something that doesn't allow light through. So this is just uh, cardboard. Gazanfar is hiding behind that uh, cardboard, and we'll get to why in a moment. But what that does is it stops excess light from bouncing around the room, and it stops it from bouncing down the lens. See, a lens is really good at focusing light that's directly pointing at the sensor, but it's not so great at light that's pointing off axis. And what ends up happening is you have light bounce in through the lens and bounce around and create light leaks or distortions. So you end up with desaturated images or low contrast images when you have off axis lighting. And that's what happens if you don't block off the lighting of your aquarium. So this is the first photograph that we took. Uh, this was without doing really anything. We just turned on all of our systems and saw what we captured. Looks okay, but we wanted to do something more. And the first step is to make that background pop. So if you have an aquascape or if you have a tank that you really want the ability to bring out that background, you can either make it really dark, we'll get to that in a moment, or you can make it really bright. And we decided to make this tank really bright. So this is a flash. It's a remote flash. We set off the flash and it caused an explosion of light for just a fraction of a second. You don't have to do something with a, a fancy piece of equipment, though. You can use whatever you have around. Most of us have multiple aquariums. It is a curse of being an aquarist. Why not use a couple of your spare lights on other aquariums to fill in that back area? You don't need to spend a whole lot of money. The result, though, was something like this. Suddenly, the background is popping. Suddenly, you see the structure of the tank really clearly. So if you compare those two, I think one of them is much stronger than the other. But I don't want you to get the impression that this is something that just happens. These are four photos that we considered as potential finalists for what we wanted to enter. We took thousands of photos. And the reason we took thousands of photos is because the fish are uncooperative. And if you want a beautiful photo, you've got to have the patience to take a beautiful photo. It doesn't just happen. And I want to maybe set that expectation for everyone that if you are planning on spending five minutes taking a photo of your aquarium, you're going to end up frustrated. And you're going to say, why don't my tank look like everyone else's? Well, it's because other people are spending hours capturing that photo. Now, I want to zoom in really closely on this tank. And you'll see the surface of this tank is a mirror. Part of the reason we didn't use this photo was because the surface of the tank was a mirror. There were no ripples on the surface. When you compare that to this photo, where there are ripples, this one feels much more dynamic. But it's really hard to capture ripples in an aquarium, especially when you've removed all of the equipment for your photograph. So how do you do it? The answer is with a hair dryer. So Gazanfar was behind all of that cardboard because he had to hold a hair dryer in place and blast the surface of the water. But the result is that you have the fast flowing movement of a stream without any equipment in your aquarium. It really is kind of a magic trick. So ultimately, this is the photo that we went with. And this photo does have some compromises. If you look close up at the plants, we photographed this tank for about six hours. And many of the stem plants are closing, or they're already closed, because plants have a day-night cycle just like we do, and they want to go to sleep. So we kept the lights on way longer than they were used to, and their natural biology kicked in, and they began to close their leaves. So if you're considering taking a picture of your planted aquarium, and you really want your plants to be their best, take it during the normal hours of your aquarium's lighting. There is a caveat, though. You shouldn't take a photo of an aquarium during the day. And that's because aquariums are glass boxes. They're super reflective. So the best course of action is to take a photo at night. So if your tank is looking really beautiful, why not shift your light patterns or your, your day-night cycle on your aquarium by three or four hours so you get a couple of hours of nighttime 
for your photography. When you compare it to when we first started photographing, you can see the difference. There's a pretty substantial difference. But ultimately, we felt that this was the best composition of any of the photos, even though the plants weren't their best. The fish were all in the perfect position, with the exception of one that was off in the corner. But that is life. I want to also talk to you all about the power of lighting. And this section of the talk is really more a thought process, an experience in what it's like to light an aquarium. Because ultimately, what is photography if not painting with light? Regardless of whether or not you're talking about an aquarium or a photos that you want to take on vacation, light is what you're capturing. You're not capturing objects, you're capturing how the light bounces off them. So let's play with that. This was a tank created by my friend Nick, who is right here. Hi, Nick. Uh, Nick is the aquarist at the Glen Echo Park Aquarium, which is in a wonderful aquarium in the DC area. It represents local habitats. So this was the aquarium uh, when I first showed up, and I actually asked Nick to kind of let it, not clean it before I came and photographed it, because I wanted to see what I could do with a tank that looks more typical of what a home aquarium might look like. So this is what I first started out with, and I want to point out all the potential problems, things that you've probably experienced at home. So for instance, the fish really blend in with the rocks, which makes sense. This is a biotope. It's representing fish in their natural habitat, and fish like to camouflage. So a lot of your fish are going to blend in really well with their environment, which isn't great for photography. In addition, we didn't remove any of the filtration. In the past, uh, photo shoot, we removed the filtration because we were using a really brightly lit aquarium and we wanted it for a show tank. But I wanted to do something that people at home could replicate, something that all of you could do without disrupting your whole aquarium. So we left the filtration in. Um, we also have some algae on the back glass, which is not super appealing. And we have the reflection of windows in the background, because even though we photographed at night, there's light on in the room. And finally, we have more filtration and a bright white CO2 tube. So ultimately, there's a lot of distractions in this aquarium that we have to solve. So we're going to go through the process of solving them, and then we're going to build this aquarium into something really beautiful. So the first step is to turn off the lights. I turned off everything that wasn't on the aquarium. That meant all of the other aquarium lights. That's a thing that people often forget to do when they're taking pictures of uh, an aquarium in their fish room. Uh, I, we also turned off all the overhead lights. That got rid of all the reflections on the glass. You can tell the difference uh, between everything on and everything off. It makes a huge difference. Then I set the color temperature of my camera. Now, this is about as technical as I'm going to get. I will happily answer technical questions during the Q&A. But in terms of technical questions, uh, I set the color temperature. So light has a color temperature. We probably all know that from working with aquariums. Um, and you want your camera to match whatever the colors are on your light fixtures. In this instance, my camera was thinking everything was a little bit greener than it actually was, so I just set that manually. You can also set it automatically. Your phone automatically color adjusts, and it does it pretty well. But I like to do it manually because it gives a more consistent output. Then I moved the lights forward. So just to show you the difference, all I did was I took the existing lights on the aquarium and I moved them forward. All that does is it removes all of the distractions in the back of the aquarium. It's probably the simplest trick that you can do to make your aquariums really pop. Um, just move your existing lights around. Next, I tried playing with colored lights. Now, we're going to use colored lights later on in this you know, setup, but I wanted to show you what they look like without the main lights on because it's really hard to see them otherwise. So I added some red light to the left-hand side of the tank and some blue light to the right-hand side of the tank. And the reason I did that was because all the rocks looked very similar. And you can play with lighting to make a tank more dynamic. So when I turn the lights back on, you can see that 
one side of the tank is a little bit cooler than the other side of the tank. And I thought that was an interesting effect. You can see the difference here. On the rocks, you've got that warmish tone. And this was just something I was playing with. It's an experience and it's a process. And ultimately, I decided to not go with the red light. I wanted to go with a different color. Um, I ultimately went with green. And the reason I went with green is that I wanted to put myself in the space of the aquarium. So what would nature actually look like? In a habitat where these fish exist, the rocks closest to the surface would have a little bit of algae growing on their surface. And that's true in this aquarium as well, but I wanted to highlight it. Just bring a little bit of green into the aquarium. And I did that really simply by using a green LED panel. Now, this is an LED panel that I bought off Amazon. It cost around $100. It's pretty inexpensive. But if you aren't willing or don't have a need for getting something like this, what you can do is go to a craft shop and get some cellophane, so some green cellophane in this instance, and wrap it around one of your other aquarium lights, and you can add a little bit of light that way. It's a really easy trick to add color and paint with light in your aquarium. So the problem that I was seeing as I was looking at this aquarium was that the fish now had a little bit of a greenish hue and they were still blending in with the rocks. So I tried something else. You can see here that the fish now pop. How did I get them to pop? Well, they're reflective, they're silvery. I added a little bit of light to the bottom of the aquarium. Normally, light comes from the top, but in a, in a natural habitat, the sand on the bottom reflects that light, and it actually, that, that fill light is what we call it in photography and video, it really separates an animal from its background. Now, I thought that this was a little bit too strong, so I thought, well, maybe I'll add a little bit of blue, because blue has a sense of coolness, it'll make the system feel like it's a really cold water system. But that still didn't feel natural to me. I wanted to embrace the actual colors of the fish. So I added a little bit of orange. And that little bit of orange really makes the fish pop. It's also helpful if you look at a color wheel. Green and orange aren't exact opposites, but they're pretty far apart. And as a result, we are able to separate them pretty easily in our brain. You can see, not only do the fish pop more, but their individual scales come into focus, and you can see the actual anatomy and structure of the fish in a way that you can't um, on fish that that's not catching. For instance, the fish on the far right of the photo, there's no orange catching on that fish, and its scales kind of disappear. So that's the power of lighting as well. Even the fish down at the bottom that are against the rocks that previously blended in pop into focus. You can see in this wide shot the orange light reflecting on the bottom of the aquarium. And here you can see the setup. So we've got our green panel up on the top, and then we have a little orange light stick down at the bottom. That's another relatively cheap light stick I bought off of Amazon. Um, again, can be done with just cellophane or even a shop light, because often shop lights have a very warm color relative to what aquarium lights use, so you could just use something like that. An incandescent shop light would do wonders to light up your fish. The result is something like this. Now, oh, sorry. I want to talk to you about how we get our fish in position. There are two approaches. The first is to lure the fish, and the second is to scare the fish. Uh, it's always better to lure the fish versus scare the fish. Um, you can scare the fish by tapping on the glass. We all know that you're not supposed to tap on glass, but it does cause the fish to school. The other thing that you can do is what Nick is doing here, which is waving his little fingers. Um, these fish are trained to come to us for food, so if they see you, they will swim in one direction, and you'll suddenly get a schooling behavior like this. Now, this is actually more of a shoaling behavior, but it's something that represents nature. Because if you imagine yourself in this habitat, suddenly you can imagine all these fish swimming against a current. And the photo becomes more real. So this was the final photo that I created in camera. So this is all done in camera. But for all of you at home, if you have any background in Photoshop, this is not something you can do in a competition where we want a uh, true representation, but I wanted to clean up this photo just a little bit. 
Um, this is what the tank looked like when we started. This is what the tank looked like when we finished. Really simple techniques to get us there. Um, but there are a couple of fish swimming in the wrong direction, and it kind of violates the feel that I was going for. So we're going to go through removing those and removing a couple of the distractions. First thing that I did was the reflection up in the upper right-hand corner really bothered me of uh, the water hitting the edge of the aquarium, so I just darkened that down. You can do that in Photoshop, pretty easy. I removed all the speckled, all the bubbles from the water as well. A simple thing to do in Photoshop. But critically, I also removed the fish that were bothering me. And the reason I was able to do that was because I took thousands of photos of this aquarium. So I just took a photo where there were no fish. Um, for instance, if we want to take a look at the uh, far left-hand side, there's a fish in front of the plants there. So I just found a photo where there were no fish in front of the plants and used that section of that photo there. And because I kept all of my uh, settings exactly the same, I was able to clean up this image. And I'm okay with doing something like that for personal use, because if you wanted to have this photo framed and put on your fish room wall, why not have it be the most perfect version of your memory of it? Then I cropped out the top because I didn't think it was very useful. Um, and now you have a final setup, something that really does look like a beautiful representation of an ecosystem. The other thing that lighting can do is add depth. So for instance, this aquarium is by my friend Jen Williams. She's doing demos over at the OASI booth um, throughout the day. Um, she's a wonderful aquarist. And this tank we wanted to photograph for competition. But this tank was really, uh, really shown with depth perception because there's a lot of depth to this aquarium. There's a lot of layers. But when you only have one viewpoint, when you only have one uh, camera lens, you don't get that depth of field. It's lost. And then everything gets compressed. Excuse me. <clears throat> so what do we do to solve that? Well, I added light. First, I lowered the water down to a level that felt more appealing. And then I pumped a whole bunch of blue light into the back of the aquarium. The reason I did this was, again, because I was trying to capture what the natural world looks like. See, when we're out in nature, we look out towards the mountains, and the mountains disappear into a bluish fog or a bluish, bluish haze. Excuse me again. <clears throat> That's because air, while transparent, does have a slight color, and over time, that will build up. So five miles away, suddenly you can't see that mountain quite as clearly. The same thing is true in the water column, especially for these fish that were in one of the Rift Valley lakes in Africa. That water has a really high mineral content, and as a result, the water looks really, really blue when you're 10, 15, 20 feet uh, away from you. And I wanted to recreate that in a relatively shallow aquarium. How I did that was, same basic tricks. First, I used another uh, relatively inexpensive, but you know, this is all stacking up as a lot of lighting equipment, a relatively exp inexpensive spotlight. And in doing so, I was getting directional light. That's something that I think is really important if you're creating a biotope aquarium because the sun has one point. You have a point light source. An LED system has perhaps hundreds of light sources, so you reduce those shadows. But if you have a single point light source, you get really strong shadows. Then I added a blue light. You can see that blue light is pointed really <laughs> um, ineloquently at the back of the aquarium. I did that with uh, it kind of fading off as it reached forward in the aquarium, and in doing so, the farthest rocks were really bright blue, and the rocks closest to the camera were a normal color. And then I did, uh, I added a little bit more light with this light panel. And I mentioned this earlier, but this is what we call a fill light. So if you were ever to have your portrait taken, um, you might see flashes going off. And there's usually multiple flashes. There's usually the primary flash, the key light that fills your face, and then there is a fill light that fills the shadows of your face. We do that because if you don't fill the shadows, all of that detail is lost, and your face looks really, really high contrasty and sharp. 
but if you fill in the shadows just enough, it maintains that depth without losing data. And I was able to do that here, just sh shining light just off camera. Finally, I added some uh, light panels that I duct taped to the wall um, behind the aquarium to light the uh, back of the aquarium blue. And I also taped a hair dryer to the wall because in this instance, we didn't have quite as many sets of hands as I did with Gazanfar's tank. So the result was we took a tank that looked like this and we made it into a tank that looked like this. Same exact tank, same exact day. When we think about aquarium photography, what I always think about is what are you trying to capture the spirit of? And then go from there. So if you're looking at reference photographs, if you're saying, oh, I really love how this tank was photographed, look not at the structure of the tank, but look at the lighting of the tank. Look at what's going on there. Why is it working for you? And then think about how someone might have done it. Maybe they added light off axis. Maybe they added a bunch of light up above and they kept things in really deep shadow. But hopefully now you've got a little bit of insight into how that is done. I'm going to use my third and final primary example here to talk about this aquarium that was also created by my friend, Nick. So Nick sent me this photo. I took it with a cell phone. The color values on this photo are a mess, but it shows the uh, aquascape really clearly. And he asked me if we could photograph it. And my initial reaction was, so there are two big overflows in the back of the aquarium that look really ugly, but they're important to keep the aquarium running, and you probably have experienced tanks like this yourself. So what do we do? Well, I hopped into Photoshop and I started imagining what I wanted. So I darkened that background out and had faith that I could figure that out. And then I added light beams because the fish that we were working with were these sunfish, and the sunfish like to hang out amongst the debris. They don't really like to go into the water column. And knowing that, knowing that it was going to be a struggle to capture fish up in the upper quadrant of the tank, I needed to do something with that space or you'd end up with a relatively uninteresting photograph. So I thought, what if we add sunbeams to represent light pouring into a shallow stream or pond? So we started with this tank. Um, I move, I've already moved the lights forward a little bit. So the background is already disappearing. You can see my reflection in the aquarium glass a little bit. And then I did this. So uh, what we did here, I'll zoom in. You see little spotlights. Remember how I talked about directional single point lighting? That's what I was trying to recreate here, but I didn't have bright enough lights. So we used four little spotlights. Again, things that you can buy off of Amazon, I think, this set of four costs around $50. They're actually for like mounting under your kitchen cabinets. But in this instance, we just uh, attached them to a two by four. And then I used aluminum foil and I created what are basically flags. So in photography, when you're blocking light, you block light using a flag that creates artificial shadows. And in this instance, I wanted to create sunbeams. And in order to do that, we have to have shadows. So I created these long uh, pieces of aluminum foil that kind of represented branches in my mind and created really dynamic shadows in the aquarium. The result was a photograph like this, something pretty interesting. But it still didn't have the pop that I was after. So I tried a new technique, something that I wanted to experiment with. I asked Nick if he could gather some silt from uh, the aquariums, from the sand. I wanted a really fine mica silt, something that would stay uh, in the water column for a prolonged period of time. The reason why I wanted to do that was I wanted to recreate photography above land or above water where you have fog. Fog makes photos of people and landscapes really, really dynamic. It's why photographers love taking landscape photos in the early morning with all that mist because it creates depth. I wanted to try to recreate something like that here. And the best way to do that was with silt because we've all experienced an aquarium that is really, really silty and completely opaque. So out of the silt, it looks pretty terrible, um, but we mixed it around a little bit, and within about two minutes, it had settled and dispersed enough that now it was just a fog. 
And suddenly I was able to get a photograph like this, something where the hardscape disappears into the background, almost as if disappearing into mist. And the fish are brightly lit up by those beams of light pouring into the aquarium. Again, I was thinking through this from the perspective of what would nature look like? And what nature would look like is you'd get little bits of sun where the sun was able to hit the water column, and then where the trees were overhanging the stream bank, everything would go into darkness. Because that really is what it looks like when you snorkel in one of these streams or ponds. I also want to show you uh, this photo. This is, again, by my friend Nick. Um, and this was the first place photo that we captured for uh, paludariums for the Aquatic Gardeners Association uh, two years ago. And this is a really good example of what you can do without a whole lot. So I talked about fill earlier. I added a little bit of fill light to the bottom of the aquarium because it just felt a little bit dark, just used a light off axis. You can see how the plants in the far left are a little bit brighter than you might think they are. But the only other thing I did was I used a towel. See, we used our normal aquarium lights. I moved them again forward towards the front of the tank. And then because they were shining a little bit too brightly on these plants up towards the top of the paludarium, I wrapped them in a towel, reducing the light output, and I was able to get a perfectly exposed photo. And that's, again, one of those things that you can do. We all have towels at home. We all have our aquarium's lights. Very easy to augment your light just a little bit. So I want to wrap up with talking about how to photograph your fish and how to photograph your plants. So I really love photographing the entire aquascape because I think it can often be really beautiful. This aquascape was not designed to be beautiful. It was designed to be a habitat for fish. So this is a tank set up by my friend Ricky, uh, Ricky Chala up in New York City. And he spent years setting up a beautiful tank filled with hill stream fish species. And this is a great example of what do you do when you really want to photograph the fish rather than the aquascape? Well, the answer is to get up close. So I'll let you see a little bit of this video. These fish are beautiful. This is a video that I've, for some reason, never had the time to actually turn into a video on my YouTube channel. So video like this only exists in this talk. But um, I want to go back to this photo, or this aquarium again. So let's talk about how to photograph these fish, because I did that same thing that same day. One thing that you can do is you can get an individual fish, and you can get it as close to on axis with the lens as possible. You don't want it off axis, because you're talking about a very small fish. And by off axis, I mean not exactly parallel with the sensor of your camera. Because um, if it's off axis, even a little bit, when you're talking about macro photography, you start to lose depth, or you start to run into depth of field issues. But I also wanted to capture the spirit of the aquarium, and I think that's something that we often forget about, the idea that I just want to get that close-up of the animal. You lose the context of that animal. And when you surround the fish with all its compatriots, and you see the the system as a whole, those individual fish become more beautiful. Most of you are probably looking at that fish down in the bottom center, but all the other fish really tell a story. This is the story of a, not a school of fish, but a group of fish of multiple species all living in one ecosystem. But you can do really cool things as well. For instance, this is a bottom-dwelling fish. So what I love about bottom-dwelling fish is that they are slow moving. So even without taking out a flash or using any fancy camera equipment, if you just have the most basic version of a lot of photo editing software, you can do something called image stacking. So I took this photo. You can see how its tail is totally out of focus. Well, while it was sitting there, I also took about 15 other photos of that same fish just by adjusting the depth of field on my camera. And then I was able to stack them all together to create a perfectly in-focus macro photograph, something that's pretty easy to do once you know that it's a capability that you have. I also played with lighting, because while normal lighting captures the direct colors of the animal, it often loses the typography of the animal, the structure of the animal. So 
you can experiment and play with lighting. I lit with blue light from above and orange light from below. And you're able to capture the individual scale structure of the fish. And you're able to see things and highlight parts of the animal that you don't see otherwise. You can also capture the story of fish in their natural habitat. So these were fish that I brought into my home aquarium. I set up this aquarium because I wanted to shoot what are called set pieces. Um, so in natural history filmmaking, which is what I do for a living, when you talk about animals that are smaller than about, let's say, uh, a rat, it's really hard to film them in the wild. So you film them in a set, you recreate nature the best you can, and then you shoot all your close-ups there, and you shoot your wide shots in nature. So I wanted to do this for a film that I'm working on on the Rio Negro, and I needed to set them up in situ. But sometimes that's not what you're after. Sometimes you really are after capturing the beauty of an individual fish rather than its ecosystem. And that's where I want to encourage you all to think outside the box. So for this last little section, I took animals and plants outside of the aquarium to see what I could do with them. So in this instance, this is my living room. Um, I have my or I have the tank that uh, used to be my biotope over on the right. And then I've got my aquarium or my uh, camera and a bunch of lighting. I built a very narrow aquarium. So this aquarium is 18 inches wide, 14 inches deep, and it's an inch and a half um, front to back. And the reason why I built an aquarium this way is because I didn't want the fish to be able to swim back and forth. I wanted them to be on axis. We talked about that earlier. And I didn't want them to have the ability to have, oh, two of these fish are in focus and one of them isn't because they're you know, a little bit farther back. So I built a really narrow aquarium. And then I put a sheet of gray paper in this instance, lit it up, and I was able to add fish into the aquarium. So you can see here, I added some cardinal tetras into the tank because I was planning on photographing them for a little bit. I added a heater in there as well. The reason I did that was because this is, in total volume, about a half gallon of water, and that cools really quickly, and I photographed this in the winter, and I didn't want them to get too cold. But the result is that you're able to capture really beautiful images of fish really, really easily. And when I added different colors to my background, it highlighted different things. For instance, in this photo, what really pops is the beautiful eye of the cardinal tetra, something that's often lost when you're looking at the stripes then I wanted to highlight the blue of the cardinal tetra, so I added red so that the red would disappear. And then I added green, which felt like a middle ground between the red and the blue, so that both would pop. Now, I want to wrap this up with, what if you don't have a professional camera setup? Well, A, you don't need a professional camera setup, you just need a camera. In this instance, I wanted to photograph some plants using just a cell phone. So this was a $50 lens attachment that I bought off Amazon. Um, it clips onto your, your normal phone. Does, doesn't really matter what brand of phone you're talking about. And it converts your normal camera into a macro photographic lens. So using just this camera and about an hour of my time, I was able to capture a bunch of photos of plants. I captured these last weekend at another aquarium convention. So we have up here really close up images of plants captured with a cell phone. We'll get to how I really captured this in a moment. Um, but the result is you're able to see the actual structure of the leaf. You're able to see how the plant grows. And in, in some instances, you're almost able to see the cell walls of plants. And you're able to celebrate the beauty of a plant that might be relatively uninteresting, like the Anubias. So for instance, in this photo, you see the background goes from purple to orange. And you might be wondering, how in the world did I do that in like an hour time? And that's the last kind of little secret that I want to share with you as we think about how to photograph anything, is think outside the box. You can just use the background of a of your computer, set a tiny little box of aquarium water, and suddenly you have the ability to create whatever background you want. That's how every single one of those photos had a different background. The result, hopefully, is that 
going on this journey, you are able to see your aquarium with new eyes, and you're able to imagine how you can make your aquarium beautiful, not using really high-end equipment, but just using your imagination and trying to execute with painting light and thinking outside the box how to capture the images that you're after. Thank you so much. So I, I did promise that if anyone had any technical questions or any general questions, I'm happy to answer them. But if you have technical questions, you felt like I didn't scratch that itch, happy to talk about that as well. Does anyone have any questions? No? I've killed you all with, with photography talk? That's fine. Oh, uh, yes. When you're setting up a tank um, and you're trying to make the scape look as natural as possible, how do you do it to ensure that you're not making it look artificial, like it actually looks like the natural environment and not man-made? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's more about aquascaping, but the, I think the reality is that nature is kind of messy and imperfect, um, and that can play to your strengths. What nature doesn't like are right angles, nature doesn't like consistency. Um, even a plant that looks really consistent, that has a consistent leaf pattern, each one of those leaves looks a little bit different. So what I will generally do when you're talking about creating like a natural layout of something, um, for, I'll give you a really specific example of like gravel. So if you've got little pieces of gravel, rather than placing them, if you just throw them in the aquarium, that will create a natural distribution much more than your eye can create on its own, because we're really, really bad at creating randomness. And that really is fundamentally what nature is about. Now, in terms of photographing an aquarium, um, our ideas of what nature is are really augmented by natural history filmmaking, which I am absolutely guilty of. We recreate a world that we want you to imagine in your mind's eye rather than what really happened. So it's hard to, unless you've actually gone into a stream and looked at it, it's really hard to recreate something and say, well, that's a photograph from the wild because those were created by a person as well. So just, if you really want to create a natural environment, I've gotten to my answer eventually. I would go snorkeling in a local stream. That's like always where I come back to when I talk with people is put on a snorkel and stick your face in a stream. It's the coolest thing in the world. And suddenly you'll be like, oh, that's what nature looks like. I can just recreate that. Anyone else have any questions? Cool. Oh, yeah. You cannot photograph at night. Is there a way to remove the reflexes? Sure. So if you can't photograph an aquarium at night, um, let's say that you're going to like a public aquarium or a friend's house and you need to photograph that aquarium then. Um, the first thing that I would suggest doing is still turning off all of your lights, still closing the blinds as much as possible. The other thing that you can do in that instance, if you're getting a lot of glare and you can't remove that glare, is to shoot slightly off axis again. So basically, rather than pointing directly at the, uh, at the aquarium, you're gonna see yourself in the glass in that instance. If you shoot slightly off axis, either up, down, left, or right, you can get a little bit of play with that, and on, in your photograph, you won't notice that that much. So that's, that's the best way that you can do it if you can't reduce all of your light. Anyone else? Yeah. How many fish tanks have you made? How many fish tanks have I made? Um, I've probably created, well, I mean, if you're talking about aquascapes, that's a very different thing. I've probably created around 20, 25 aquascapes. But if you're talking about individual aquariums that I wouldn't classify as an aquascape, I don't know, maybe 100, maybe 150. I've been doing aquarium work for 26, 27 years now. So a long time. Um, yeah, that's, that's the other major thing is, uh, everyone that looks really talented at this has been doing it for a really long time. It's really rare that you pick up a new hobby and you're like, oh, I'm a master at this. So um, that would be the other thing that I would say is, A, photographs are a lie. We create really beautiful aquariums and then we work with really talented people to capture beautiful images. Um, you don't know all of that. You don't know what the aquarium looks like before we go in and we really manicure it. Um, so you're comparing yourself to something that's not real. It's kind of like comparing yourself to a model in a magazine that's been photoshopped and their entire profession is being attractive. Um, but yeah, I've done about 25 aquascapes, I would say. Maybe that's an underestimate. Maybe I've done 
30 or 40. Um, but maybe 20 really, really good ones. All right, yeah. What would your like advice be when you get discouraged like photographing like I get really I really love doing it but I get discouraged like doing it and then going back and editing because it just feels like so much work trying to find the perfect shot. Yeah. So um, in terms of getting discouraged, I will tell you uh, an example story. So uh, everything takes a really long time and. I say that not to discourage you, but to set realistic expectations for yourself, that everyone takes a really long time. Uh, when I talk with folks that um, you know, are going on a trip or a safari to Africa, and they say, how do I capture photographs like the you know, Nat Geo photographers, the people that I work with on a regular basis? And the answer that I give them is not super satisfying, because it's not, here's the camera gear that you would use. The answer is, oh, if you want to take four really beautiful photos, do what the Nat Geo photographers do, and be out in the field for seven months. That's how long it takes to capture a spread of photographs. So what I would encourage you to think about is that this is actually the process, that you are honing your craft, and it's not that you're taking longer than everyone else is, it's that you don't see how long everyone else is taking. But everyone else is taking that long. To capture something really beautiful, it does take time. And it also takes persistence. As I mentioned, you know, going out in the field, um, it's not just, oh, I, I know exactly where that animal's gonna show up, I'm gonna capture a beautiful image. It's, I was there every day for 100 days before that animal showed up. And that's really discouraging, but that is how really beautiful stuff gets made. Hopefully that's a, a helpful answer. Did I see a hand go up over here, or am I good? No? Yes. To reduce glare, can you just put a black background behind you? Yes. So if you have the ability to put a black, back, black background behind you, you can do that. The other thing that you can do is you can use a polarizing filter. Um, polarizing filters uh, orient light in one direction, and they can help reduce glare. Uh, polarizing filters are sold for just about any lens. Uh, they're usually somewhere in the order of 50 to $100 for each one of those. So I would rather go with finding a blanket in your house than spending extra money, because my goal is to get this accessible to people rather than saying, oh, you need to buy $1,000 worth of gear to get started. But a blanket is a really great suggestion. Uh, it's OK to make a, a controlled mess in your house to photograph a beautiful aquarium. Um, you just have to clean it up afterwards. Anyone else? Yes. Some books you could recommend? Yeah. Books on what? Aquascaping or photography? Sure. So the book that I would recommend, uh, well, George Farmer will be here tomorrow. Um, I really, really love George Farmer's book on aquarium work and aquascaping. Um, in terms of getting inspiration for aquascaping. Um, the internet is really the most powerful place for that because it's free, but if you um, really want a physical copy, the three old Amano books are really, really great. Amano captured beautiful images of aquascapes. Those books are not in print, but they're beautiful, and um, they're really great for inspiration for you to think about how to photograph aquariums. I think my time is now roughly up because I want to make way for the next speaker, but thank you all so much. <laughs>